Welcome to SCOTUScast, a project of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. Our contributors join us from around the country to bring you expert commentary on U.S. Supreme Court cases as they are argued and decisions are issued. The Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Thank you for joining us for this post-decision episode of SCOTUScast. I'm your host, Spencer Karen. On May 17, 2021, the Supreme Court decided Edwards v. Vinoy. The issue is whether the Supreme Court's decision in Ramos v. Louisiana applies retroactively to cases on federal collateral review. In a 6-3 opinion authored by Justice Kavanaugh, the Supreme Court affirmed the ruling of the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit, holding, quote, the jury unanimity rule announced in Ramos v. Louisiana does not apply retroactively on federal collateral review, end quote. Justice Thomas filed a concurring opinion in which Justice Gorsuch joined. Justice Gorsuch filed a concurring opinion in which Justice Thomas joined. Justice Kagan filed a dissenting opinion in which Justices Breyer and Sotomayor joined. Kent Scheidegger, legal director and general counsel at the Criminal Justice Legal Foundation, joins us to discuss this decision and its implications. This week, the Supreme Court made a significant and, in my opinion, long overdue change in the law of retroactivity. The decision came in the case of Friedrich Edwards, who committed a series of brutal crimes in Louisiana 15 years ago, including armed robbery, kidnapping, and rape. One rape was committed by Edwards personally and the other by his accomplice. Edwards confessed to these crimes. Despite the strength of the evidence, there was one holdout juror on the rape and kidnapping counts and one and one of the robbery counts and two holdout jurors on four other robbery counts. <clears throat> At the time of the trial, Louisiana permitted non-unanimous verdicts, and its law in that regard had been expressly upheld by the Supreme Court in 1972. Edwards' claim that non-unanimous verdicts are unconstitutional was rejected on the basis of this precedent by the state courts, the federal district court, and the Federal Court of Appeals. While his his petition was pending in the Supreme Court, that court overruled its precedents and decided that unanimous juries would now be required in all states. In response to the argument that convicts with final convictions, as opposed to those with pending initial appeals, would seek to have their convictions overturned, the lead opinion in Ramos versus Louisiana said, quote, the worries outstripped the facts and discussed how very restrictive the rule for retroactivity on habeas corpus is. The use of habeas corpus to attack a judgment in a criminal case has ebbed and flowed throughout American history. At the founding, there simply were no such attacks allowed, provided that the convicting court had jurisdiction. The use of habeas corpus as a de facto second appeal expanded in the early 20th century and then grew enormously in the 50s and 60s. The decision in Teague v. Lane in 1989 was part of a general retrenchment in habeas corpus during the period that followed. In the Teague decision and the earlier decision in Griffith v. Kentucky, the Supreme Court abandoned the approach to retroactivity that had been developed during the Warren court years and instead adopted an approach proposed by Justice Harlan in two dissents. Under this view, all new rules established by the Supreme Court are fully retroactive to cases that are pending on the initial appeal at the time they are announced. Rules that change the substantive law regarding what acts can be made criminal and what punishments can be imposed also apply retroactively on collateral reviews, including habeas corpus. However, new rules that change the procedure followed at trial are generally not retroactive on habeas corpus. Justice Harlan first proposed this rule only eight years after the landmark decision in Gideon v. Wainwright. Because the right to appointed counsel for indigent defendants had such an enormous impact on the reliability of the trial, he noted an exception to his proposed rule to explain why he would continue to concur in extending retroactivity to any Gideon claimants still in jail at the time. In Teague, The court endorsed this exception while noting that it was highly unlikely that many rules as central to fundamental fairness as Gideon remained to be made. In the decades that followed, the Supreme Court made many new rules of procedure, but it did not apply any of them retroactively on habeas corpus. It has never fully explained the exception, but it regularly said that whatever may be said for the new rule in question, 
it did not have, quote, the primacy or centrality of Gideon. Uh, particularly relevant is Justice Scalia's opinion for the court in Summerlin versus Stewart. That case involved the retroactivity of a decision that had extended the jury trial right to the finding of the aggravating factor that made a case eligible for capital punishment. Summerlin noted that the extension of the jury trial right itself to the states was not so fundamental as to require retroactive application. <clears throat> so the extension of that right to a new issue could not be. Summerlin also specifically rejected the argument that the new rule was retroactive because it better fit the original understanding. That argument goes to whether the rule is correct, not whether it is retroactive. Given the body of precedent established as of last year, it would seem to be a very easy case that the rule of Ramos versus Louisiana was not retroactive on habeas corpus, and the lead opinion in that case itself suggested as much. Non-unanimous juries had been tolerated in two states for decades, and the Supreme Court had not seen fit to take up the issue until last term. England, where the unanimity requirement began, dropped it in 1967. The holdout juror for acquittal who convinces his fellows to come around made a good movie, but it rarely happens in practice. In practice, in states that do require unanimous juries, either the holdout comes around or the hung jury results in a plea bargain or a conviction in the second trial in almost all cases. In Monday's opinion in the Edwards case, <clears throat> Justice Kavanaugh's opinion for the court recited this history and noted the important interest in keeping criminal judgments intact, despite a later change in constitutional interpretation when that change does not made, raise a major doubt of the accuracy of the earlier procedure. The court said, quote, when previously convicted perpetrators of violent crimes go free, merely because the evidence needed to conduct a retrial has become stale or is no longer available, the public suffers as do the victims. Even where the evidence can be reassembled, conducting retrials years later inflicts substantial pain on crime victims who must testify again and endure new trials. In this case, the victims of the robberies, kidnappings, and rapes would have to relive their trauma and testify again 15 years after the crimes occurred. These considerations are too often ignored by courts, and it's good to see them recognized by the court in this case. Applying the Teague exception precedence, the court concluded that the Ramos rule was not the kind of watershed rule, as it is called, that qualified for a Teague exception. The petitioner and the dissent offered three reasons to find retroactivity, none of which can be squared with precedent, the court said. <clears throat> First, there is the claim that the significance of the jury trial right demands retroactivity. But Teague itself made clear that the importance of a rule for reasons and its effect on the accuracy of the verdict is not enough. Although unanimous juries are a tradition going back to the common law, a rule that one or two holdout jurors cannot prevent conviction does not make a trial fundamentally unfair or its result unreliable. Second, and relatedly, there is the claim that because the rule is a return to the original understanding, it should be retroactive. That, too, has been rejected in multiple precedents. The Summerlin case mentioned earlier rejected retroactivity for a rule based on original understanding. Crawford v. Washington, which returned to the original understanding of the Confrontation Clause, was also not retroactive under Teague. Third, Edwards claimed that the effect of the Ramos rule in preventing racial discrimination requires retroactivity. The simple answer to that argument is Teague itself. That case denied retroactivity to a rule against intentional, direct discrimination in peremptory challenges, while the Ramos rule has only tenuous and historical connections with discriminatory intent. The court concluded, quite correctly in my view, that under a long line of retroactivity precedents, the Ramos rule does not qualify for the watershed rule exception and is not retroactive on collateral review. Indeed, the court really could not have ruled in favor of retroactivity without undermining the entire line of precedent and effectively abandoning the reasoning of Summerlin in particular. However, the court went further and said it was time to abandon the pretense that any such exception still exists at this late date. The court has noted many times that it is unlikely that any such rule remains to be made, but the court has at long last made it official. Sixty years after the Warren Court began federalizing and constitutionalizing nearly every rule of criminal procedure, there simply are no defects left of the magnitude of the one corrected in Gideon, and therefore no rules of Gideon magnitude remaining to be made. Any changes remaining to be made are fine-tuning by comparison. The existence of this phantom exception serves only to make lawyers brief it and courts decide it time after time, always with the same result. The decision was six to three, with Justice Kagan writing the dissent, joined by Justices Breyer and Sotomayor. 
There are separate concurrences by Justice Thomas and Gorsuch worth reading, but we will skip them for now in the interest of brevity. The dissent is surprisingly shrill, accusing the majority of abandoning respect for precedent and of needing to abandon the second exception in order to reach its result. This is very strange. It is definitely not Justice Kagan's finest hour. The majority certainly did not need to abandon the second exception to reach its result. It held that Ramos did not qualify for that exception by applying the precedents correctly. It is the dissent that would abandon precedent by expanding that exception in ways already rejected by multiple precedents. Finally, pronouncing the second exception dead merely takes a step that numerous precedents over many years have said was coming. The Edwards decision applied precedent correctly to spare victims of heinous crimes like the ones in this case from having to go through retrials. They cleaned up a long-standing anomaly in the law of retroactivity. Hopefully we will see decisions like this one from the current court. Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUScast. SCOTUScast is a project of the Federalist Society, a not-for-profit educational organization of conservative and libertarian law students, law professors, and lawyers, founded upon the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast series, including SCOTUScast and Practice Group Podcasts, on iTunes or Google Play. For an archive of past podcasts, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at fedsoc.org slash multimedia. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash multimedia. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 